Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. You begin as a person, an innocent baby. And the moment you were born, your culture and your family and your environment and your educational system begins to form your belief system. And that could be detrimental. Because if your culture and your environment does not teach you the truth, then you will believe a lie, even about yourself. And your belief system becomes your personal philosophy out of which you influence other people. And that's why the foundation of your public leadership is determined by your private belief system. And that is why I am teaching you carefully, line by line, to challenge your ideas about yourself. Because you came out of a history, just like I did, where we were formerly oppressed by colonial imperialism, which taught us some ideas that were not true about you. You were trained to be maids and yard men and farmers and workers on plantations and serving tea and cooking for people. You were not trained to own a business and build a company and lead a country and buy your own oil field or invest in your own gold mine. It's always somebody else doing it because you've been trained that you cannot and should not try to own an oil company. And so we accept the idea. So our philosophy says we cannot own that. So we have been trained to be an employee, not an employer. As a matter of fact, we've been so brainwashed by the wrong philosophy that we are afraid to own things. We are afraid of success. Even the religion we were taught reinforced our lack of self-belief. You know what you were taught for the last hundred years in religion. Your doctrine came from another country. Your belief system was imported by people who owned your forefathers. And they taught us songs to sing, didn't they? Songs like, I got a shoe, you got a shoe. All of God's people got a shoe. When I get to heaven, I'll put on my shoe. I'll walk all over God's heaven. Interesting song. So the enslaved, oppressed person sang that song. And they sang it to the master, the oppressor. They said to the master, I got a shoe and you got a shoe. All of us are God's people. We got shoes. You wear yours now, I'll wear mine in heaven. That's a dumb song. But we sang that in churches and believed it. And even had the spirit on it. I got a shoe. <laughs> That's a dumb song. What you're telling the master is, you 
to prosper now. I'll stay poor now. I'll be rich later. Something's wrong with that philosophy. And so they make us afraid of prosperity. They say things like, you don't want to prosper, you might forget God. So stay poor and you'll stay humble before the Lord. Philosophy. As a man thinks, so he leads. So the pastor who comes out of that philosophy preaches to his people. Stay away from politics. Stay away from money. Stay away from power. Stay away from influence. Just hang on until Jesus comes. And that is what we preach. We actually preach to our people that they should not be leaders. And they should not own. And they should not have influence. And that's why the creator sent me to talk to my cousin. You are a ruler. You are a owner. You are an employer. You can run any business. But you got to change your belief system. Let me show you a picture of a little boy. See that little boy? I wonder who he is. Can you tell me who he is? No one knows who he is. Just an innocent child. Remember, everybody is born as a person. This little boy came from a family, a broken home. His father abused him. His father was religious, but yet beat him, hurt him. And the little boy grew up with a twisted belief system about God. Let me show you who this little boy really is. That's the little boy. He looks so innocent, doesn't he? But the boy is really that man. That man was trapped in that boy. His name is Adolf Hitler. His philosophy was very serious because he believed in an idea that he picked up from the Romans. And I want to close this session talking about the Romans because Papua New Guinea is ruled by the same ideas that the Romans had. Hitler believed that he was born and chosen by God to restore the Roman Empire. He believed that. He believed that he was created and born to bring back the glory of Rome and therefore he had to subdue all of Europe because Rome ruled the whole world from Africa all the way to England. Rome was the most powerful empire and kingdom in history. Rome was the first kingdom to colonize the whole world. No kingdom has ever arisen to be greater than Rome. Rome was the most successful colonization process in history. Rome ruled the whole known world of Europe. And Hitler believed that he was born to restore 
the glory of Rome. He called it Mein Kampf. Where did the Romans get their ideas from? And this is important to think about leadership. The Romans conquered the Greeks. The Greeks were the ones who invented the philosophy of leadership that control our world today. Please listen to me carefully. Because Jesus was born under the Roman Empire in a Roman colony controlled by Greek ideas. So don't miss this. The Greeks were the most influential philosophers in modern history. The Greeks were the ones who invented the ideas that control the world right now. As a matter of fact, the Roman Empire adopted the Greek philosophy when they invaded, invaded Greece. The Romans were so powerful that they conquered Greece and destroyed the Greek Empire, but they did not destroy the Greek libraries. The Romans are smart people. They took the Greek libraries and they adopted the Greek ideas and philosophy of leadership. And so the Romans became Greeks in thinking, but Romans in military power. I want to give you quickly why this is important to you in Papua New Guinea. Because Papua New Guinea is a product of the Romans. And Papua New Guinea was ruled by Greek ideas. And that's why we are having difficulty right now with the mentality of the Papua New Guinea people. So you have to listen carefully what I'm going to say. I'm going to talk about your future and your past. The Greeks believed certain things about humanity and about leadership. The Romans adopted them. And the Europeans used them. And they colonized Papua New Guinea. And they used the same ideas of the Greeks to control Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is a very young country. You are still battling with Greek ideas. I want to prove it to you. Because every colonization process carried the Greek idea and subdued the people. What did the Greeks believe that's important to you? Write them down. Number one, the Greeks believed that leadership was a product of natural endowment. Very important words. The Greeks believed that leadership was a product of natural endowment. What does this mean? Some of you know about the Greek philosophers who changed the history of the world. Let me give you a few of their names. Plato, very powerful Greek thinker. Aristotle, very powerful Greek philosopher. Socrates, a very powerful Greek thinker. These are the kinds of thinkers who gave their ideas that control the world today. I always tell people that the world is ruled by dead men. Our countries today, including Papua New Guinea, is ruled by dead men. How? Because they left their ideas with us. Ideas outlive humans. And ideas are more powerful than death. And the Greek philosophers like Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, they invented an idea. Look at my lips, please. I'm going to quote one of their ideas. This is a Greek idea. A democrata. Democrata 
is a Greek word. The Greeks invented the idea of democracy. Democracy is not from the Bible, it's from Greece. <laughs> the Greeks developed the idea of what they call polities. Polities is a Greek word. It means chief citizen. Polities. It's where we get our word politician from. It's a Greek idea. What's a politician? A politician, the Greek says, is a person that the people give their authority to and make them chief citizens over them. It's a Greek idea. It's when people give their power to one person and tell that person to lead them and to rule them. It's called the power of the people given to a chief citizen called a polities. Listen carefully, please. Jesus Christ was born under that policy. The Romans adopted the idea that leadership was a product of natural endowment. What do they mean by that? The Greeks believe that some people were born naturally endowed with certain distinguishing factors that made them superior to others. For example, listen carefully, the Greeks believe, number two, that leadership is a product of birth traits. Birth traits. What do we mean by that? The Greeks believe that certain people were born naturally endowed to be leaders because they had certain traits that made them superior to other humans. For example, the Greeks believe that if you were born with sharp nose and blonde hair, and blue eyes and thin lips you are automatically a leader you can read this on the internet if you want to it's all there the Greeks believe that if you were born with fair skin that means if your skin was light fair and you had sharp nose and blue eyes and your hair was yellow or blonde, you were naturally a leader. You were chosen by the gods to be a leader. Now you know if that's true, there's no hope for me. I got a big nose. My eyes are brown. My skin is dark. And my hair ain't blonde. So the Greek says, if you were born without sharp nose and light skin and blue eyes and blonde hair, then you were automatically a slave. The Greeks believed that. The Romans adopted it. And so there's no hope for you being a leader. You got the wrong skin, the wrong nose, the wrong eyes, and the wrong hair. Follow me? The Greeks also believed that leadership was a product of providence. Very important word, providence. Providence is referring to the gods. The Greeks believed in many different gods. And the Greeks believed that if the gods chose you to be a leader, then you were automatically superior to everyone else. If the gods did not choose you to be a leader, then you are automatically a slave and a follower for the rest of your life. In other words, the gods choose leaders. Well, think about it. So if you were born with dark skin and brown eyes and a big nose and thick lips, then the gods chose you to be a slave. That's what they taught. That's what they believed. That was their philosophy. The Romans adopted that philosophy. Let me give you one more the Greeks believed. 
The Greeks also believed that leadership is a product of charismatic personality. The word charismatic is a Greek word. It's the word charisma. Do you know what it means? It means gifts of the gods. Charisma. Gifts of the gods. Charisma means the gifts that the God gave a person, which means they were very confident and they were very extroverted and they had a light personality and they were talkative and they were communicative and, and they had extroverted attitudes. They, they, were, they were exuberant. The Greeks say that was the gifts of the gods. So if you were quiet and timid and not extroverted, then the Greek says you are a slave. And this is why when the Romans conquered the Greeks and adopted this idea, they told the slaves, you must be seen but not heard. And I'm only supposed to see you when I need you. And you never speak. Leadership ideas. And finally, they believed that leadership was reserved for an elite group of people who were destined to be leaders in the world. And the rest of us were destined to be followers. I'm trying to teach you something that's very serious. Because the Romans adopted these ideas and made them their culture. The Romans conquered all of Europe. <laughs> From Africa to Scotland. They conquered the whole of Europe. And they implemented their ideas. So when they meant people who were not like them, who didn't have blonde hair, or light skin, or sharp nose, or blue eyes, then they automatically considered them subhumans. The, the Romans used the word for themselves. They said, we are superior, chosen by the gods. They call themselves the Aryan race. Now I'm going to give you the most important information today. Here it is. The Roman Empire ruled the entire known world. From Africa to Great Britain. The most powerful kingdom on earth under Caesar. They believed that they were chosen by the gods to rule the world. They believed they were handpicked by the gods with certain traits to dominate the world. They believed that they were superior to all other races. And that was in the Roman mentality. Do you know how Rome was defeated? No one could defeat Rome. It was the most powerful empire in history. It had the most powerful army in history. No country could defeat Rome militarily. It was so powerful that when Rome showed up, everybody bowed. And that's why you hear the statement, when in Rome, you do as the Romans do. Wherever they went, they colonized the whole world. And Jesus Christ was born right in the middle of the Roman Empire. He was born in an empire which believed that he was automatically a slave. And that's why they treated the Jewish people through whom he came as dogs. Jesus Christ was born in a colony just like me. He was born subjugated by a powerful colonial power called Rome, just like you. He was taught that he was born to be a second-class citizen. He was taught that he was born to be subjected. He was taught that if some soldier in the Roman Empire asked you to take your cloak off and give it to them, you had to give them your clothes that they were cold. 
He was taught that when a Roman walked in, you stand up and bow. He was taught if the Roman gave you his shield to carry for a mile, you got to take it. He was taught if a Roman soldier got tired carrying his spear, he could say, here, take it for me, and you have to take it. He was taught that he was not a leader, he was a slave. He was born in a colony, just like you, just like me. Listen carefully. And that's the mystery of Jesus Christ. He was born under that culture, but never allowed the culture to be born in him. Let me explain Papua New Guinea. When the Roman Empire was defeated, it was not defeated by an army. It was defeated by what destroys most countries. The Roman Empire was destroyed by immorality. As a matter of fact, history teaches that the Roman Empire was destroyed by the loins of their leaders. Your loins are right here. Their sexual life destroyed them. They died from the inside. They decayed from immorality. Fourteen Caesars, twelve were homosexuals. They slept with boys, not women. They fell in love with their lust to the point where they became so immoral that they began to have men marrying men it's as old as 2,000 years ago they were destroyed by their lusts of the flesh when a country begins to embrace immorality their demise is on the way when a country begins to sanction immoral acts that God condemn, don't worry about their country, they are dying. No matter how powerful your guns and military weapons are, if your morality becomes a cancer, your weapons become useless. And Rome died in the bedroom. And so the Roman Empire fell apart it break up through strife look at me please this is important and when the Roman Empire fell apart it broke up into small little kingdoms it used to be one kingdom but now it became many kingdoms let me name some of the kingdoms that the Roman Empire became there was a kingdom called Franco. We call it France today. That was a Roman kingdom. The second kingdom was Spanian. We call it Spain today. It's a Roman kingdom. Another kingdom was called Portugal. We call it Portugal today. It was a Roman kingdom. Another kingdom that came from the Rome, Roman Empire was anglo britain Anglo-Britannia. Great Britain is a Roman kingdom. We call them England today. Anglo. Light skin. Interesting, all of these kingdoms have the Roman philosophy. And they decided to expand their kingdoms. And so the French and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the British send their ships out. 
They are Roman in their minds, Greek in their thinking. And they come to take over territories. Hmm. So they began to invade islands and continents. They, they came to the Caribbean. They came to Africa. They came to Central America. They went out to South America. And then they came to the Pacific. And they brought with them their philosophy. What's their philosophy? Greek. What does the Greek teach? They are superior, you are inferior. Your nose is big. Your skin is dark. Your hair is not blonde, and your eyes ain't blue. And your lips are thick. You are, the gods gave you to me to be my slave. So why educate a slave? Why give a slave nice clothes? Why give a, a slave a, a property? Why give a slave a, authority? Why give a slave money? Why give a slave a future? Philosophy. And so is the story of colonization. It's easy to sell a slave. After all, uh, they're not chosen by the gods. Now let me say something very quickly before I wrap this up. Uh, every philosophy comes from an ideology. Ideology means ideas. Every ideology needs a theology to justify it. So every time there's a philosophy and an ideology, there must be a theology to give it credibility. And this is why religion was used to even justify the ideology of superiority. Do you know what they taught us when I was a child? They said to me, you fell out of the sky. We had no idea where we came from. We were taken away from our homeland. And we had no history. And we'd ask the white teacher, where did we come from? And they would say, you fell out of the sky. You have no heritage. You are one of the fallen angels. Theology. They say, look, the Bible says that, that, that the beast of the field shall carry water for you. You are the beast that God talked about. You will carry water for me. And they would teach this in Sunday school. Philosophy. And here we are now, still on the Democrata. 200 years of conviction that you are not equal to others. 200 years of miseducation that you cannot think sophisticatedly. 200 years of believing that others with certain traits are much more superior and more intelligent and better than you. Philosophy. And so they say, you must be quiet. You cannot speak much. You're not supposed to express your ideas. You keep your thoughts to yourself. Just make tea. You're not supposed to speak up when you see something going wrong. How dare you? You're not smart enough to see what is wrong.
leadership problems. Here's the biggest one. Since you were chosen by the gods to be followers, why waste my time on you, training you to be leaders? So if you study all the colonies in history, including mine, where I'm from, uh, the colonizers never trained leaders. And what's amazing is when they finally abandon and leave you, uh, they expect you to fail. And that's why they leave. They always say, well, uh, if... And of course, there are more of you than us, so we're going to get out of here in case you kill us. But uh, uh, we know you can't lead anyhow, so your country will fail. So they expect you to fail. Well, you know, uh, I don't understand that because if you didn't train me, how can I succeed? And when you do fail, then they blame you and say, see, I told you, you ain't intelligent enough to succeed. They forget that my failure is proof of their failure. And that's why this leadership training series is important. I have come to correct 200 years of history. You are a leader. You can run this country. You can lead the world. Take a deep breath. Tell your neighbor I was born to lead. Clap. I want to show you this before we go because it's so important all the world leaders if you study them they're all battling with these issues and by the way uh, in one of my books I did research on what happens to a people who have been oppressed for over a hundred years and I discovered that they all have the same problems I use a case study of the children of Israel in Egypt. They were oppressed for 430 years. And when they finally came out of Egypt, they couldn't get Egypt out of them. And as soon as they got independence, or should I say deliverance from Egypt, under Moses, Moses was their leader, and even Moses had psychological problems. Remember, he was born <laughs> in Egypt. But you'll, you'll remember that when they came out of Egypt, they didn't go into freedom. They was just delivered. Don't confuse deliverance with freedom. Papua New Guinea is not free yet. You are simply delivered. You are in the desert. And why does God take you to the desert? Because he doesn't want you to go into the promised land with Egypt in your mind. So, he keeps you in the desert to try and change your mentality to think like a free person. Don't ever confuse independence with freedom. Independence is an opportunity to become free. It is not freedom. They were delivered from Egypt. They were independent from Egypt, but they still wasn't in the promised land. You are not yet in the New Guinea that God promised you yet. Because that Papua New Guinea requires a new kind of mentality. One day, my wife and I went to Egypt to visit, and we, we were in Israel for 10 days, and we caught our flight from Israel to Egypt. I will never forget my experience. We took off from Tel Aviv, and before I could fix my seatbelt, the announcement came over the PA system. 
please prepare for landing. I became confused. We just took off and we were landing. Now I thought that Egypt was far away from Israel. <laughs> and so I became confused. I said to the flight attendant, I said, excuse me, ma'am, uh, is there a problem? She said, why? I said, why are we landing? She said, we are about to enter Cairo, Egypt. I said, but we just took off from Israel. She said, yes, sir. I said, but we didn't fly. She said, I know. I said, we're landing. She said, yes, we're landing. I said, wait a minute. It's only been 20 minutes. She says, yes. I said, wait a minute, lady. I was in Israel. That's Canaan, the promised land. And in 20 minutes, I'm in Egypt. She said, yes. I became confused. I started calculating. Let's see. 40 years. Why would it take 40 years to make a 20-minute journey? Interesting question. When we, when we arrived in Egypt, we went to the hotel, put our bags down. Our guide came later that day to take us to see the pyramids and go to El Luxo and all the places of Egypt to see all the pharaohs, you know, the history and everything. And we went to the pyramids and everything, and it's beautiful. And we felt like we entered the Old Testament. Because that's where the Old Testament, really, most of it took place. And I said to my guide, when we were driving, I said, Sir, uh, how far away are we from Israel? He said, depends on how you get there. <laughs> I said, okay. If I drove in a car, how long would it take? He said, it'll take about seven hours. I said, what if, what if I walk from Egypt to Israel? He said, it'll take 40 days. I said, what about the aircraft? He said, 20 minutes. I began to calculate. I said, wait a minute. If I drove in a car on a bus, it's seven hours. If I walked, it's 40 days. If I flew, it's 20 minutes. Hmm. I went back to my hotel room, confused. I picked up my Bible, because I had to go and find out what happened. And the Bible says, and they left Egypt, headed toward the promised land. But God did not take them directly there. I'm quoting the Bible. Because they were afraid in their minds. So he led them the long way around. To get Egypt out of their minds. Now here's my mystery. This is Egypt. This is the promised land and it's only 40 days walk why would it take 40 years and I was confused that means he kept them going around in circles for 40 years do you know why because they kept telling Moses we want to go back at least we knew where onions came from we knew where garlic there were pots of food in Egypt let's go back to the British way it's too hard to run your own country it's too difficult to take responsibility for your own future take us back to a place where other people ran our lives we didn't have to think Take us back where they provided peanut butter and cheese. And God says, none of you will enter the promised land because you don't want to get rid of the Egypt thinking. So he led them for 30 years. Do you know why? 
Because 40 years is a generation. That means he kept them going in circles until he got what they were carrying. They were carrying the next generation. Joshua was not born in Egypt. He was born in the wilderness. Caleb was not born in Egypt. He was born in the wilderness. There are some people in this room who cannot make it to the promised land of the new Papua New Guinea. Why? They still want to go back. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the one right behind you. And this is why the young generation is the hope of Papua New Guinea. And I say to the older members of this great country, ask God to change your mind. Ask him to deliver you from the scent of oppression. Ask him to give you a miracle, not in your body, but in your mind. Because their mind kept them out of the promised land. It's amazing. God healed their body, but never took them to the promised land. He fed them food, but never took them to the promised land. He kept their clothes for, for, for 40 years, but never took them to the promised land. In other words, God will preserve you until he gets what you want from you, and then he'll kill you. If you don't want to change your mentality, he'll bury you in the desert. Moses never made it. Not even Moses made it. How close are you to the true Papua New Guinea? Can you see it? You know, two hours ago, I was sitting with your prime minister. We spent almost an hour together today. And I asked him a question three times. Same question. I said, Mr. Prime Minister, what is your vision for Papua New Guinea? What do you see as the new Papua New Guinea? And he talked about what he saw. He saw a country where everybody was educated, free education. He saw a country where people had good health and, and welfare. They, they were taken care of. Diseases were almost non-existent. He saw a country where opportunity for people to own companies and to build businesses and to have share in the, in the investment of their country. He said, I see this. And I told him, then you need to educate. You need to provide free education for every child in Papua New Guinea. Because until their mind is free, they are stuck in the wilderness. Sitting in this room are some of the greatest leaders in the world. And I believe that with all my heart. You are an awesome leader, young woman. But you have to unlearn what you've been taught by history. You must be free from the Greek mentality and the Roman ideology. You must be set free from the spirit of colonization. And believe that you can govern this country effectively by God's help. I beg you today, to be delivered from Greek philosophy because I too was a victim. Now let me close with how I got delivered. You want to know how I got delivered? Traditional leadership teaches that leadership is controlling and imposing your will on people. That is not true leadership. Secular leadership says that leadership is management of people. Leadership means you are superior to the followers. They teach that leadership means that you are served by your followers. 
They teach that leadership is measured by how many people serve you. This is not leadership. Please go back and invest in those books because until you get mentally free, you'll never make it to the new Papua New Guinea. The promised land is a beautiful one. I'm afraid for this country. This country has so much wealth in it now that we need true leaders to govern it. And that's why you're here today. Maybe God is preparing you to go into political life to govern this country in the fear of God, intellectually stimulated by the truth about yourself, where you do not harm people for your own private ambition. Here's my philosophy of leadership. It's opposite to the Romans. Number one, I believe that trapped in every follower is a hidden leader. Number two, I believe that every human being was created to lead and design to dominate. Number three, I believe leadership potential resides in every human being. Number four, I believe that you were born to lead, but you must become, through a process, a leader. And number five, I believe that true leadership is not doing things, but manifesting yourself. I believe it all my heart that the purpose for true leadership is not to maintain followers but to produce other leaders. I believe these things as my philosophy and that is why I travel around the world to come here to wake up the sleeping leader on the inside of you. My philosophy helps me set people free, not oppress people. My philosophy helps me believe in your equality, not your inferiority. Where did I get my philosophy from? I got it from the one who created all humanity. And here's the bottom line. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says, and God said, let us make man. How? In our own image and in our likeness. Why? To let them have dominion over the fish and the birds and the animals, and the trees, and over all the earth, and all that creeps upon the ground. Why did God create you? To have dominion. He didn't say let some of them have dominion. He said let all of them be dominators. Tell your neighbor I'm a dominator by creation. Say it loud, I was born to dominate. Shout it loud, I was born to dominate. Tell your neighbor I'm a dominator by birth. Tell your neighbor I was designed to dominate. Come on, say it loud. I was born to dominate. God said, let them have dominion over the earth. So the purpose for your creation is dominion. And therefore, dominion is the most important word to you. Verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image. Watch this. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, have dominion. That means male and female are equal before God and they are both dominators. Clap your hands anyhow. <laughs> My wife and I are equal but different. She's a leader, and I am a leader, but we are different, but we are equal. Male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and said unto them, both of them, have dominion. In other words, the word dominion is an important word. It tells you why you were created. I did some research for you. Write it down. The word dominion is the Hebrew word radah. R-A-D-A-H. And here's what it means. It means to govern, to rule, to control, to master, to manage, and to lead. In other words, God gave you birth to have dominion over the earth. To lead. 
And here's the bottom line. If God created you to have dominion, which means to govern, to rule, to control, to lead, to master, then that means he built into you the ability to do it. Hmm. God built into the seed the ability to become a tree. But the seed could die as a seed. Because it's in the wrong environment. For 180 years, some of our countries have been in the wrong environment. We've been fed Greek ideas. And so we can't come forth. And that's why this leadership conference is here. Not to make you superior to anyone. To simply make you yourself. You are a leader. A dominator. A ruler. A governor. A master. A controller. Ladies and gentlemen. Let me put it this way. He said, let them, which means male and female, every human being is a leader trapped on the inside. And here is the mystery of how it works. When I first met this beautiful lady, when I first saw her, rather, Mother Teresa, before she died, what a woman. She was four feet, five inches high. Little lady. She weighed 102 pounds. And she spoke to the United Nations. She was a nun. What made her so powerful? She discovered her gift. She discovered her purpose, her passion. Listen, please. Whatever you were born to be is trapped inside of you. If you notice what God did, God didn't just give you dominion. He specified what you should dominate. He said, have dominion over fish, birds, cattle, plants, and things that crawl on the ground. That means the only thing you're supposed to dominate are fish. Check your neighbors, see if they have any fins. Come on, look around. Any fins? Any scales? Birds! Check your neighbor. Any feathers? Any beaks? Look around. Plants! Check your neighbor. Any leaves? Any roots coming out of their shoes? Things that crawl. Check your neighbor. Do they crawl on the ground on all fours? No. Then the only creature on earth that you are not commanded to dominate is another human. And that is why in order for slavery to work, they must reduce you from being a human. Hmm. And so they call you subhumans. Highly developed monkeys. Sophisticated chimpanzees. Intelligent gorillas. They just don't want to make you a man, a human. Why? If you're a human, they can't dominate you. So any attempt to control, master, rule, or dominate another human is completely ungodly. That includes even a pastor trying to dominate his members. You are not supposed to control your members. They are not your property. You are not to control and own 
anyone in your company. And so Jesus was living in a colony ruled by people who oppressed and dominated humans. His disciples, which means students, he was trying to change their thinking just like we're doing today. And one day they were sitting down just like this and he heard them talking to each other. And they were arguing which one of us is the greatest. Hmm. They must have been from Papua New Guinea. Always want to know who's in charge. Fighting over positions. And he said to them, what are you discussing? He heard them. And they were so embarrassed. He said, are you asking who's the greatest? Among you? And the Bible says he called a little child. He says, come baby. And he put a child in the middle of them. He said, the greatest among you is like a child. A child never desires power. <laughs> Two days later, <laughs> he was sitting, having a meal, and two of his disciples came to him again, and they said, uh, they said, uh, Mom, uh, Mom, go and ask him if both of us could become deputy prime ministers when he become king of his kingdom. Forget the other ten. Make sure look out for ourselves, Mom. He listened to a woman. And their mother went to Jesus and said, Sir, good master, uh, will you make sure that my two boys sit on your right and your left when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus was shocked. And he said, woman, first of all, you don't know what you're asking. You can't ask for leadership positions. He said, secondly, you shouldn't try to be like other people because you couldn't drink the cup they drink. The word cup means price. You couldn't pay the price for their position. Never be jealous of someone because you don't know what it costs them to get where they are. Can you drink the cup they drink? Leaders don't become jealous of other people's positions. And then he said these words. To sit on my right and my left is not mine to give. These places belong to those for whom they have been <laughs> determined by my father. That means you can't even pray to Jesus for a position. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. It's okay. Listen. Don't look at me. This is very important. And then he said these words. You know that the Romans and the Greeks, I'm quoting Matthew chapter 20. You know that the Romans and the Greeks love to lord it over one another and lord it over the people. The word lord means to own something. 
That's why you call your landlord, landlord. <laughs> it means owner. He says, the, the rulers of this world love to own people like they are property. And there are some pastors who got that same spirit. These are my members. They ain't your members. <laughs> the apostle Peter says, pastors, do not lord it over God's flock. The same word Jesus used for the Romans. You don't control people. True leaders don't own people. They set people free to become great. He said, do not lord it over people like the Romans do. And then he says these words, it shall not be like that among you. Because in my kingdom, if you want to be a great leader, you must become the servant of everybody. And that means true leaders serve their gift to everybody. It doesn't mean to become a subservient. It means to serve yourself to your generation. To give your gift to humanity. I'm doing that right now. This is my gift. My gift is training third world leaders. This is my gift. What is your gift? Because your gift is your area of leadership. And that's why great leaders never seek followers. They seek to serve themselves to their generation. He ends the seminar with this statement. He says, just like the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve himself a ransom for many. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.